Hi, Les from Thailand here. Today's video is going to be about Thailand. Why Thailand? Why move from the UK to Thailand? Crime, violence and stupidity with the UK government. Then with a few reasons why I left England and now I live in, in Thailand. I'd sooner live in Thailand than any time live back in the UK because of the story I'm going to tell you from now. It involves crime, corruption and various other things with regard to living in England compared to living in Thailand. I have such an easier life now living in Thailand than I believe I would have if I lived back in the UK. So where's my experience from all of this lot? 30 years in the fire service, uh, I worked with various different organisations within the within the fire service, the probation service, I was a person who took people out in a community service via the probation service for two years part time. I worked for the Prince's Trust, dealing with uh, people who were poor education, no skills, qualifications, getting them into further education, or moving them on to a job. And let me have a look. Uh, oh yeah, I was a, a property maintenance manager dealing with houses that provided immigration houses for immigrants, illegal immigrants that came over to England. I was a property maintenance manager as far as the electrics are concerned. I had a property that I rented out to the to the government agency who then rented my property out to the immigrants coming over from wherever they came over. This is a long time ago. So I speak with a voice of experience and knowledge of these things. And we're just going to have a rant on with regard to what my feelings are with regard to Thailand or the UK. Um, now this might be a long one, so go and get a coffee, sit down and watch the video. So where did I get my experience from? Working for 30 years in the fire service. I didn't like what was going on towards the end of my career with regard to the violence and one thing and another. It, it was awful and the people that I was dealt with with regard to violent criminals and all sorts of things. So my 30 years as a fire fighter when it was ending up, I enjoyed being a fireman, I really, really did. It was a good public service to be in, and you felt proud to be a firefighter, and everything that, that comes with this. It saved many lives, changed people's lives, and unfortunately, some people, you couldn't get there in time to save their lives or whatever. But, Towards the end of the fire brigade service, we were going to more and more incidents where we were spat at, sworn at, bricks thrown at us. And that's just for the starters. Really, what was happening was gypsies. Gypsies were a, a really bad lot of people to deal with. Um, for instance, they used to steal cable, burn the cable off during the night, and then uh, sell the, the, the copper. So of course, we were always getting called out to cable on fire during the night, three, four, five o'clock in the morning. So we had to go out and put the fires out because toxic smoke that was being released everywhere from these gypsies setting fire to um, cables to steal the copper. So the theft from various places was horrendous from the gypsies. The millions of pounds worth of damage they caused. And of course when we went out to put the fires out, these copper cables hadn't been all burnt the plastic so therefore they were angry that we were putting the 
the fires out. And of course, would they admit to it that it was their cobble? No, no, somebody just, somebody just came over and set fire to it. So, one day after we've been to the same fire, three times in one night, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, I was the guy who was putting the fire out. And I went over to this gypsy who was having a smirk outside of his caravan watching us putting the fire out because I was angry and I said so you don't know who this belongs to no 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 he said no 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 he said he said somebody just came over and set fire to it all right so I said if you don't know who the owner is you don't own it you don't no 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 he said so I grabbed all of it in my little fit of temper and threw it to the four corners of the field that it was in and then behold this gypsy who didn't know who it belonged to was shouting and swearing at me saying I know where you work I know where you live I'm going to follow you home I'm going to kill your babies this gypsy because I threw away all of this cable that he didn't know it belonged to funny that isn't it so anyway that was just one one event with regard to these people and our jobs we were getting sworn at and spat at and threatened and uh, we also used to go to people setting fire to derelict property and it was fun for them these little cherubs to booby trap these houses so when we were sending firefighters in they knew that if they said on the phone call that there were some children playing around in the property, so there may be children inside there, we would go in and look for these kids that were reportedly still missing in this, this house fire, this derelict house fire. And what they'd done, they cut through the floorboards, put um, mattresses over the over the holes that they're cutting the floorboard so booby trapped. Now who would want to do that? Who in their right mind would want to do that? You know, and and they did all sorts of stuff. Some of the houses that we would go in, they were doing drugs from the houses. So the booby trapped the houses, so when we went in, not just us, but obviously booby trap it for the police. And they had syringes everywhere. And they had dog excre excrement everywhere. You know, and some houses they had pit bull terriers roaming around the houses. So if we broke in, then we'd get attacked by pit bulls. Ah, it was, it really was awful. And this is just one little job that I used to do as a firefighter. And you know, the respect you used to get off people in the early days when I joined was fantastic. But now, the whole lot of it has changed. This is what society, why is society going this way? You know, what? why would people want to attack firefighters? In England, November time, November the 5th, we have a firework thing for celebrating Guy Fawkes night. The run up to Guy Fawkes is probably the firefighters worst worst weeks because what happens we get called out to various incidents where they've set fire to rubbish so we have to go along and, and put it out and there are some fences along certain roads that they used to strap rockets to and as we were traveling towards the incident set the rockets off. So they were like rocket attacks on firefighters. And then when we were at various bonfires, they um, used to fire rockets at us, bangers at us, fire any, anything. So in the last 10 years of my fire brigade career, this was happening on a, a regular basis. And um, that then becomes the norm. 
we weren't allowed to do anything about it. We couldn't capture one of these people because then it was classed as as um, kidnap. I remember this little little boy, maybe he's five years old, and he was. I was watching the fire engine back so he didn't hit anybody on the street. And this little five-year-old boy threw a half a house brick at me. Just missed me head because it just turned around as he threw this rock at me and it just missed me head. So I was going to grab all of this little, little Johnny and take him home and tell his parents what a charming little young man he was. And my boss told me not just to walk away and leave it. So angry at this, this little five-year-old wasn't going to learn any lessons. I argued with my boss. And he said, no, he said, we're not allowed to do that. He said, because the minute you put him into the appliance, he's classed as kidnap. And, um, you know, I had my thoughts about that, about, no, it's not kidnap, it's making his parents aware of what little Johnny's actions were doing when he was younger. So hopefully one day that they could change his view on life. But, no, this is the society that I've walked away from and left in England. So now another topic following this, and this one may be a bit more controversial. It's about the immigrants coming to, to England. Now before you switch off, before you switch off and think, oh, I don't want to hear about this, I don't want to you know, get involved in an argument or whatever, Again, I'm very in the middle on this one. I can see, I can see every, every side to it because I've been involved with regard to immigrants coming over to our country. I leased one of my houses out to the government who actually put immigrants in this house so I can speak from experience as to what I'm about to say. And um, again, dealing with various groups and the unfairness of the people who live in England compared to the immigrants coming over here, whether they do it legally wise or whether they jump on a boat and come across the English Channel and arrive on, a, on our shores. So I'm speaking from my own personal knowledge here. I'm not, this isn't hearsay, this isn't from anybody else. This is my story. And I've got no problem, no problem with the immigrants coming over to England to look for a better life. After all, this is why I'm in Thailand. I've come to look for a better life. I decided to leave the UK because of the stories I'm telling you today. And my life over here is a million percent better than what it was over in England. So I've made the move. So for these people who are fleeing war on Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, or wherever they're coming from, they're leaving their country because they're seeking a better life. And I've got no problem with anybody seeking a better life. My problem is being held to ransom by some of these people and our own government not seeing a sense. So this is what the story is about, about how I feel about that. I'm not racist. Again, if, if they're gonna to come to a country that's offering all of these freebies, why not? If I'm sure if we were in the same situation, we'd do the same. So, okay, getting on to some experiences and where I can come from this was when I was in the fire service I was also an electrician I had my own electrical business and one of my contracts was with an agency that rented these houses out to both students and the immigrants who were getting housed up, up in Middlesbrough Cleveland now for those people who don't know about Middlesbrough Cleveland it's sort of a a poor area to, to live, especially in the inner city. So therefore housing was cheap and there was lots of derelict houses about in these areas. So some government people took over these houses and started renting them out. And I'm sure some of the MPs and that, that were into this system were getting backhanders to 
to rent these houses out but that's another story so I'm going on to these houses that were prepared for the immigrants and some things went wrong now being an electrician and I was already working for this company you know with their student houses they called me every time something went wrong with the houses now as winter approached um, England the houses got cold and the immigrants were starting to complain because it was cold and they weren't warm so therefore they installed electric heaters in every room so imagine a three bedroom terrace house with an electric heater in every house uh, electric heater in every room in the living room in the kitchen everywhere they could get an electric heater they shoved an electric heater on so these people that obviously didn't pay the the bills either these heaters were on 24 hours a day and these heaters at the place in were meant to be on 24 hours a day and the shock to the electricity system i went into at least four or five houses where the electricity uh, fuse board they just set fire because of the amount of energy that was going through so therefore I advised them of what they needed to do was that having all of these electric fires on isn't going to do the electrical system any good and it would cause fires so therefore they put central heating system into every house that they were renting um, for their tenants and I went to one house one day and this is this shows the hypocrisy of our government in England I went to one house one day and at one side of the house that I went to was a student who was at university and because he was renting a student house and on the other side of him was an old age pensioners two old a, a woman and a, and a husband on the pension and the house that I went to this is November time late November time when it's cold and I remember pulling up at the house and the windows were open to this house and I thought how strange November time when the windows are open so of course when they opened the door a blast of heat came and met me as I opened the door and I went in and all of these refugees were sleeping on the floor or cooking their own meals and whatever they were doing but the heat in that house was like a greenhouse they were all walking around in t-shirts and you know and then I just instantly thought of the old couple that lived next door and the student can't afford to have their electricity on because they have to pay for it whereas these immigration immigrants type of thing get everything paid for that's one of the stories with regard to how unjust I think it is in England I've got no problems with it I've got no problems with, with you know going through the system if they do everything correctly no problem but uh, I just think it's a little bit unjust the crime the crime here's another story that I know from experience I was dealing with people that were stealing cars and uh, they get caught by the police and then the, they were sent on one of my courses because my course was very hard hitting and over a two year period and I'm proud to say this that I had an 80% success rate that none of the offenders that came on my course re-offended within two years so 80% success rate but I've got to say my course was very very hard hitting you've seen some pictures that you would never want to see pictures of people who've been run over by cars and squished and body parts all over the place so just imagine that and ten times worse and we used to put them into a situation that they were scared and we frightened or I should say me and my team used to frighten the life out of them and then show them the horrors of 
people being run over and squished and very badly hurt. And I said, like to these people, these are the people that you run away from because you don't care, because you don't want to be get, you don't get caught. So if you hit somebody, you're going to run away. You're not going to stop and look and say, oh, oh, what's happened there? So it was very, very hard hitting. Very hard, very shocking. And, um, but I won a, an award for that. And as I was very happy that my little bit of contribution into helping people to change their ways or mend their ways, albeit just a, a little fraction of a little bit, but I, I was there, I've been there. I don't believe everybody is unsavable, otherwise I wouldn't have done what I did. If I just changed one person's attitude in life, then I was happy in being able to do that. But when you see society rewarding the criminals, it's it sort of hurts you. Because we wanted to do work for the people that were succeeding at school. Not the best, but the people who were trying the hardest. But there was no rewards for them. But for some of these people that were creating havoc and I remember one young man, 28 times he'd been convicted, yeah, sorry, 28 times he burgled people's houses and he was caught. After 28 burglaries, and he got 120 hours community service for burgling and destroying 28 people's lives because the, once you've been burgled, it isn't a very, very good feeling. You live in fear for the rest of your life. And it's going to happen again. And my society in England, 120 hours community service. And why did he burgle these people's houses? For drugs. Yep, for drugs. I had one young man who robbed an old lady in Redcar where I lived. Robbed the old lady, pushed her over, stole a handbag, and she had 85 pounds in a handbag. And he took it, and that same afternoon he went and got a tattoo with the 85 pound that he stole. So, these are the people in society that I didn't want to be with. I wanted to walk away and never, ever, ever have to deal with people like that ever again. And that's what I did when I got to 50 years old. I retired and I travel around the world. And I learned many things traveling around the world, which I'll do another video about what I learned. And the experiences I got. And I've got to say, living in Thailand, with its faults, it's not a perfect place to live, but with its faults, it's perfect for me. Look where I live, I live here. I live a beautiful lifestyle. Don't fear of crime anymore. I don't fear getting things stolen. I don't fear drug addicts. I don't fear been spat at, abused at and told where to go. This is the beauty of living in Thailand. So it's my little rant with regard to living here and living in England. Let's have a look, I've got some notes here. See if I've covered everything. Yeah, okay, uh, the Prince's Trust. The Prince's Trust, I was dealing with people, um, no skills, qualifications or education, trying to get them into jobs and trying to get them into further education to improve their well-being and being able to get jobs. That was from 16 to 30 years old, was my clientele group. And I've got to say, maybe it's out of the 40 students I had in the year, only two of them went on to actually doing something with their lives. And the reason why? Benefit system. In England, the benefit system, people don't want to come off it because it's so difficult to get back on it. So people give up the will to look for a job and think to themselves, well, I'd, I get money for free here. So where's the encouragement to try and get people to work? People like me, thousands of me, are trying to get these people to do it, but 
the benefit system, no, they won't. They have to make things a little bit more harsh. Um, so anyway, that was my rattle going on. Have a look at these videos here with regard to life reset and living in Thailand, living the dream, retired and living the dream even. That's what I do and I love every minute of it. So from Les, retired and living the dream in Thailand, until the next video, bye for now.